what I was intrigued by was the you know the 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 level of um uh, the practical application to a theoretical context and my thought was how could I then introduce you know very traditional business simulations in in, in a university that has got a very predominantly creative context. And we do deliver courses that are, you know, as 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 a creative university that are highly creative, uh, but have uh, business modules. And I thought it would be quite a good opportunity to try and see how, you know, business simulations could actually be used on those courses. So I looked around at some of the courses that we offer and looked for opportunities where we could use uh, simulation games. And from the games that are offered by Edgemundo, I looked at, you know, the option of the My Marketing Experience and also looked at the option of the ProSim. So I, you know, with consultation with the people in, you know, in our team, we came to the conclusion that we could use actually both. So we could use the My Marketing uh, Experience simulation game and the ProSim game and and across a number of the different courses that we offer. So for the BA Fashion Marketing, which is our flagship course at, at you know at uh, undergraduate level in the business school, we are using the My Marketing Experience. And to suit our purposes, which is one of the things that I'd like to, you know, to to discuss with you know you and the people on the call today is that for our purposes we decided to adapt it to be used for the first year students on the BA fashion marketing who are uh, doing a, a level four principles of marketing or principles of fashion marketing unit which everywhere else would be equivalent to introduction to marketing so we had to find a way of how we would use mar my marketing experiences on uh, an introductory level for introduction to fashion marketing the module we are also using the my marketing experience on another course which is the ba buying and merchandising so again it's a very specialized course around buying and merchandising where we decided that we thought with the feet and the discussions that we had that my marketing experience could work well on that particular course. So we're using a module in buying and merchandising and having to use my marketing experience simulation game for that. And when it comes to the other product that Edgemund is offering, which is a ProSim, again, with our discussions, we then decided to use this on, on a third level, you know, you know uh, on a level seven, and one of the courses which we use, which is uh, really interesting. and. I find this interesting when we talk to students and parents on open day. We have an integrated uh, MSc in cosmetic science, believe it or not. And it sits within the fashion business school at the London College of Fashion. And these are students who have enrolled on the course and will end up being cosmetic scientists. So they are scientists. And you know, and they 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 make scientific products. So they make lipsticks. They make uh, products um, with, with a very heavy incline on 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 being scientists. Uh, but alongside you know the the mix of the 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 the, the modules that they do within the cohort is we do a, a strategic marketing module specifically on that course. And students come and do a three years and then combined with an additional year as an integrated master's. So we use the ProSim uh, uh, as a strategic mar mar marketing module on, 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 on that course, which is uh, uh, really interesting to look at the integration of a business um, a simulation game uh, on, on a course for uh, cosmetic science students. Now, there's two answers to that question. One is they 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 always struggle with why am I doing marketing when I'm you know I'm here to learn how how to make uh, products and they do product packaging they do actual product making uh, and and they say you know we scientists why are you teaching us business and my answer to them is that who are you making the products for so firstly there's just the initial struggle of having to make them accept doing a sort of non-scientific module, which is marketing. And then because 
in my experience of actually delivering this particular module in this course, what I found was the actual learning curve to introduce them into something that's alien. I mean, these are people that have probably have never seen a marketing report, do not know the basic four Ps, uh, and, and have got no prior learning of any uh, business module. And therefore, there's a much higher learning curve to bring them around to even grasp the basic principles on a, in a, a very a concentrated 10-week module program. And that is why I thought that with the simulation game, what I have found is that that just flattens the learning curve much, much quicker for them. And, and from the students' evaluation and all the feedback that we get, uh, more often than not, students say, um, just beginning to learn basic marketing, you know, in their fourth year of their degree, uh, and then having to be introduced in something that's a completely different in terms of the discipline of the course that they're doing is much more difficult. So again, it just depends on the dynamics and how this does. So some students like to take ownership because when they think they work well, they say, yes, I'm the one that decided to do that. And then they come and tell you on a Monday, Edwin, do you know this me who taught the team to do this? So you can see that they're taking ownership and want to, you know, so sort of the glow of having made the right decisions or not. So I, I think that it helps if students can have specific roles within their teams, which then helps push how they arrive at the different decisions that need to be made in the simulation game. And they need to choose who's the final person that makes the final decision on the day before the calculation. So just also interesting to point that one of the flexibility, the fact that students can log in into the game from their different locations off campus on their own laptops and still come into the game. But we always encourage that when you make decisions that change and will, impl you know, will make implications for the team, you need to make sure you've informed all your team members. But, uh, and this is some of the students, um, a feedback that we've got is that the simulation game, which they engage with on a week by week basis in their teams, was a very big factor in terms of flattening that learning curve, generating the interest, I think the competitive nature of it, working in teams, uh, and, and that uh, works uh, fantastically well in terms of are helping them to assimilate the learning because it's much more practical. I mean, everybody on the call, if there's anything got to do with the National Student Survey, you know, the dreaded, uh, the dreaded National Student Survey on the question with academic stimulation and did you find the course interesting and were you, you know, stimulated academically? And one of the things that we found students, uh, especially, as I said, on the, the courses that are with no prior business learning was to try and you know, bring the interest and the competitive nature, uh, particularly on the pro sim. Uh, and 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 again, one of the things that as the as as a marketing head speaking to colleagues within the school, trying to sell the idea of using simulation game, uh, well, was the apprehension that this is such a big risk, and it can go either way. Is it going to put off students, and how are you going to strike the balance correctly in terms of uh, what happens, for example, the underlying, you know, the you know, underlining thing was what happens when a particular team does not win, you know, the simulation game, or they don't go up on the, you know, on 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 the stock listing. Is that going to put them off? Or is that, you know, what about the competition? Is that going to be a negative? Is that going to be? So there was always these debates of, you know, the the implication of how the game is going to affect the actual student learning. In fact, they were debating to as far as can it be a negative with students get put off and find that they're sort of being forced to do something that they didn't want. So we had to strike a balance between introducing something like this and say, was it was it going to be a win or was it going to be a complete flop? And were students going to be put, you know, uh, uh, put off extremely? Two things happened. One, the students absolutely loved the competitive nature of it. And also it was interesting that usually I, I have now come, which I share with you know colleagues that have actually incorporated in delivery simulation game on a number of the courses that we do. And I always say to them, wait until week four and week five, where the penny drops in the students think, okay, so do we need to change our pricing? Oh, I didn't know that you could do this. So I didn't know that you know in a business you could actually, I said, well, it is entirely dependent on the decisions that you make. And you know, and then you could actually you could actually see the thinking process going and say, 
oh, so should we do this next week? And, she, and then if they do that the following week, and then shh, suddenly they go up on this, you know, on the stock market and say, guess what we did? So I think that yeah, there is that element, and 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 you know, the the competitive nature kicks in. You know, the the, the wanting to win kicks in. Uh, and also just the understanding that they're in control of something. Um, uh, I find uh, really fascinating when you see that, you know, when the penny drops and they really, really get it, that, it, you know, mm -hmm. it actually helps with the learning. Yes, the students are going to set their KPIs. Yes, yes they're going to set their, um, they're going to set their uh, competitive stance, you know, with the V ANSOS matrix or what is generic or, or whatever it is. So I think it's really important from an academic point of view. And what we do at the Lana College of Fashion is because we've gone through the simulation game and know what the weekly topics will be on a weekly basis. So our lesson planning and our schemes of work will be designed to actually reflect the, you know, the topics that they're going to be opening in the simulation game uh, uh, to run alongside the things that they're going to be making in the simulation game with their academic content. And and one of the things that you said, Lloyd, was really important is for each of the teams. Uh, so usually this is in a seminar group of up to about 30 or 35 students and five groups of six or six groups of five students each is to is that as a team, each one of them to make it very, very clear what their strategic positioning is, you know, whether it's course leadership and if it's course leadership, are they then adjusting the, you know, the the, the pricing and the sourcing of the goods aligned to a course leadership strategy or differentiation and just understanding the different nuances of the decisions that they're making in line with one the kpis that they've selected to the projection of how they want to compete in that market and quite often what they overlook is to try and read the competitor information of what the other teams are doing in order for them to make their decision so to your question and say can i make this strategy what's the right strategy and what's the wrong strategy my answer to them is that that strategy is only as good as the competition and the market conditions that you're creating for yourself. So there's no right or wrong. You have to make the determination of when that is right or wrong, when you get the weekly, you know, when you get the weekly update of the, uh, of the playing period, which is usually for us, we set it on a Sunday so they can actually have the results on a Monday. So the actual uh, lesson or seminar will be on a Tuesday uh, and then the students will have a whole week up to Sunday, nine o'clock or seven o'clock when it is when we set for the calculations to be done. And then when they come back the following week, they have another week in which to make this. So they meet within the simulation game, which is how we've integrated it within the seminar. But then you also give them an opportunity to uh, to have the opportunity to actually change the decisions before the, you know, the, the calculation time set uh, over the weekend. So they normally have a very, uh, uh, I think, a very eventful nine o'clock Sunday evening before they go to bed. And I say to them, before you go to bed, just check your check your results before you sleep. So they, you know, they have an eventful five minutes after nine o'clock every Sunday evening uh, or during the during the term. And I thought, for me, from a from an academic point of view, from a teaching point of view, um, it, it it also made it easier and less dry in delivering content to a bunch of students who are having, you know, um, this challenge of us grasping something that is not, you know, the natural uh, uh, natural course of learning on a four-year course. And one of the things that I, we encourage them to do is when they're thinking as, you know, as a board, so they could appoint or assign duties like, you know, head of marketing, head of production, head of sales, or head of whatever it is in, in, in more like a conversion or company would do. And then they would give responsibilities that that person analyzes that part of data relative to their position. So then you, you give them that sense of responsibility that this person is responsible for, you know, for looking at this part of the simulation game. And then literally when they come into the class, it's like a board meeting where everybody who's ahead of whichever department has come from presents their findings to the group for quick decision making, but as you you know, as it happens, they probably won't agree. And once they've left that one hour in the seminar, still want to make those changes. And then that would be you know in relation to who is the CEO, or who is the chief marketing officer. So I find that when you give them, or I encourage them to make these, these sort of board 
decision level positions, and then each person analyzes the part of a business relative to their role, then they bring they bring it to the meeting. It's a much more effective way of working rather than all of them ha having to work on different, you know, on 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 the in on the different parts of the game in a very random and unstructured way. So trying to encourage students to structure their working and, and bring only to use the, the seminar as a reporting boardroom to agree the decisions rather than having to let them make the decisions in the seminar. But again, that's probably going to be different from you know institution from institution, but we find that works very, very well for us. Yeah. And you can stop the simulation game a week earlier. So if you're on a 10 week module and you want to introduce three or four other topics, you probably end the simulation game in week seven, you know, use the context of the simulation game and the outcomes of that, and then build on on the last two weeks that you want to include some specialist topics, which you probably think are not currently in the simulation game and how they can then, you know, add on. So, so I would say, do not get put off into thinking the simulation game does not allow you to teach a particular topic that you want to include in your module and say, and use that as a reason for not using them, because you could still create the context and then use that to piggyback at the end or at the beginning in relation to what you want to teach. I guess the point I was trying to make is the simulation game can be very flexible. You can stick to the confines and the what the Edmundo content and creation has been created, or you can use it to inform other things that you want to do, depending on the things that you want to teach on your specific module. So do not feel confined that you will then, because that's one of the things that I got from my teaching team in the department. Like, you know, we are now going to be confined to stick with what's been created in, in the simulation game. What if I want to teach students this? How can I bring it in? So we're always struggling to say, you know, if we have some content we want our students to learn and it's not, inbuilt in the simulation game, how do we bring that in? Because we want it to be part of the overall learning on the delivery on the module that we're delivering. So I can confirm that you can exercise the flexibility to use the simulation as a context and then bring whatever else you want to teach and still link it to the outcome of the simulation game. And that's how we do it. So, so we run 10 weeks okay. with, with, within blocks. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, like you say, some people are trimesters, some people are, are semesters. We so we 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 call them blocks. Don't ask me why. Somebody at the University of the Arts decided they're going to be called blocks. So we have blocks yeah. of 10, 10 weeks each. So we normally, as you say, we normally start in the second week of a ten week block. Okay. You know, we, we and then run it up. You know, um, over the ten weeks block. Um, and and the logistics in the setting is that we have a lecture. So we have a lecture seminar setup, which is probably most places have. So lecture seminar and the two hour seminar is where, you know, they will revise the content from the lecture related to, this, to the decisions they're making in the simulation game. And then they can have a meeting in seminar. And one of the logistically, the importance of having those discussions in seminar is because of the nature that we are at the London College of Fashion. We are, I don't know whether it's the right thing or ever such a thing exists, but we are a non-campus university and people come into central London, students come into central London on buses and tubes and whatever else, and they have jobs and some of them have to work. So immediately after the seminar, they'll probably disparate in different directions and, and, and we'll only have the opportunity to make those decisions within the seminar. So as much as possible, we'll try to encourage them to finish the decision-making of the simulation game within the seminar but then encourage that if they've got any other platforms outside of that at their own discretion, they can make those arrangements. But the logistic is to try and ensure that within a two hour seminar, one hour per week, logistically is enough for them to make the decisions, agree the decisions and input in the simulation game. However, experience has told us that students prefer to actually make their own arrangements you know, outside the semi outside the seminar, depending on the you know the dynamics and how the group works, until they make the decisions on a Sunday evening to actually make their decision. So yeah, from a logistic point of view, it's it's, it's important to plan it in such a way that it doesn't impinge on students, uh, uh, you know, our flexibility or availability, especially if you 
are like us, which is a non non campus university. Thirdly, of course, it builds both the soft skills and the hard skills. So you know they are forced to communicate, and I say forced because I know what sort of students I deal with. They are forced to communicate each other. I I once went on a course at the London College of Fashion for three years and asked a third year student to name two or three members of our course team, and she couldn't name five people who she had studied with from the first year. So you can see they come in very tunnel vision, sit in the legs and the, you know, and, and seminar and go home and can't name five or 10 people across the course. But when they're on a simulation game, firstly, they have to speak to the five people in their team. And then they, they probably get more interested in the team that's winning or losing. And then, and then they go to speak to each other. So it does develop soft skills uh, in terms of communication, but also interaction. So you could say that is also, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, and an added benefit to 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 the to the dynamics and the um, the, the composition of of team building across a, a particular seminar group. Because what they actually type into the simulation game uh, gets served and results into a cumulative strategic. Uh, marketing plan or strategic decision plan for whatever simulation game that has been set for you by Edimundo. So you will have, as a default, at the end of the playing period, the opportunity for the students to actually print out. A, a print button comes at the end of the games, they print that, and then they get a whole marketing report, which is based on the decisions that they would have made over whatever period that was, whether it's six weeks or 10 weeks. So by printing that, they then have a completed uh, marketing report that has been generated by the game. Now, again, depending on, on, on the institution where you are and the assessment that you've set with the students, you can then choose for the students to submit that particular report that's been generated because obviously it's been created by them during the team and that's a group report and you might as well submit that and then mark that as an assessment. However, we do things differently at the London College of Fashion. Two things. One, it is really important that at the end of the simulation game, it is not the team that has necessarily won the simulation game output. Uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis getting the best value, getting the best profit, meeting their KPIs. So we do not link the winning of the game to the marking of the assessment grade. So there's no correlation between the assessment grade and the simulation game. And we just wanted to make that very, very clear because we didn't want to 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 to, to, to get students feel constricted by playing the simulation game as also being the marking point for the assessment. So, and I was saying to Leon when we caught up before this meeting that it's, it's, it's interesting that sometimes it's not the winning team that produces the best marketing report. And quite often the team that doesn't do well, i.e. not getting the best result in running their, their simulation game over the 10 weeks, that actually writes a much more brilliant marketing report on the benefit of reflection. So there's a lot of reflection uh, and the benefit of hindsight of some of the strategic decisions they didn't make properly during the game, which they then come to correct reflectively when they're writing the report. So what we do, which is another element of the simulation game is, as I said, you can go with the printed default report at the end, or you can have the flexibility to adapt the assessment according to the requirements of your institution. In my institution, uh, the units and the modules on which we've introduced a simulation game, none of them is assessed by a group report. All of them are assessed by individual report. So essentially what happens is when the group report is generated outside of, you know, from the simulation game, they use that as a research document. And then we ask them to generate individual reports off the back of that group report. Now, how do we do that? So while we do that specifically in one of the modules that I teach, we then say, this is what you've generated from the simulation game. You've ended up being on the top. You've, you've met your KPIs, you've done this. Now, individually, how do you move this company forward? So in one of the simulation game, when we use whether it's a cosmetic products, we then say, how do you move this cosmetic brand beyond the simulation game? In the my marketing experience where we use a jeans company, you then say, right, this jeans company has ended up position number two in your town. Now. This is a group report, and these are the reasons. Can you now make reflective recommendations 
using 500 words or the next 600 words or whatever it is you decide according to the number of words limit in your in your specific assessment and quite often in our case is uh, an a, an additional uh 500 or 600 words in addition to the group report where the individual students makes a reflection and perhaps makes some future recommendations how they could take the brand um, much further or in a different direction from what has been agreed in the assessment. So one, there's flexibility to use the assessment that comes from the simulation game if your assessment is a group report, or you can adapt it to your purposes by actually asking students to do slightly more than what the simulation game generates. So on the integrated masters, uh, which is a cosmetic science, I'm quite keen in teaching the the scientists uh, business skills. And I think one of the business skills any traditional person in marketing will tell you is the ability to pitch business ideas. So what we what we do, sorry, excuse me, what we do is we do a combination of them. So so within 10 weeks, when we get up to week seven of the simulation game, we actually have a verbal presentation, which is 20% of the assessment. So each team talks about the, in, so if we talk about, again, you know, people in the room might be familiar with this. So your traditional edic analysis, decision, implementation, and control. So we go up to the point of, you know, you know, strategic analysis and strategic decision before the strategic implementation and evaluation. So the 20% of the assessment is in form of a verbal presentation. So by week seven, each team does a verbal presentation and I mark them on verbal presentation skills and the analysis and the decision-making up to week seven and they get 20% of the grade. And then the 80% of the grade comes from the 2,500 individual report, which they submit. Mm -hmm. So on that list of the question, you know, with the options that came up, I do both. I do mm -hmm. part presentation, 20%, uh, only because this also gives me an opportunity to actually gauge the contribution of the individual members of the team uh, in relation to the actual making of the you know the participation in the simulation game and then you have the you know the, the much you know much larger proportion of the assessment 80 percent being the individual report which they generate so we do like a, a mix of, of of assessment points there yeah no like i said so one uh, the simulations have got flexibility so do not take them for what they are. So you can use the flexibility either to piggyback something at the beginning, at the end, and place them only for the context that you want to use. Two, you can use the assessment that comes from there as, you know, if it's a group assessment and that takes away a lot of the things that you want to do. You can adjust the flexibility of the assessment as we do to make an individual report. And therefore, the generated report is only used as a research plan. And, and then secondly, academic stimulation it just flattens the learning curve for students that have do not have prior learning to that topic because of the engagement and 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 helping the students to stimulate um you know to stimulate the learning and then for overall it improves the dynamics of your seminar group in in the fact that students are communicating to each other and communicating with the competing teams so we have found them extremely useful and I'm, you know, I'm pleased to say we haven't told Edmundo yet, but we are actually using them again next year. Oh, well, great to hear. Thank well, you. You've, you've told us now, Edwin. That's breaking news. Yeah, yeah that's breaking news. Um, yeah. Hot off really the great. press. Yeah, that's really great. And well, um, we're looking forward to, yeah, continuing. And also just to add, I think just to add in case, you know, we have technical problems, you know, our students are given a, uh, an email to contact Edmundo for technical support. Uh, and we found that, you know, we, we do actually get the, the, the response in good enough time to let our students enjoy the experience. So, yeah, thank you very much. And again, once again, thank you for inviting me to come and speak today. Edwin, and, can people connect with you on uh, LinkedIn, for example? Yeah, people can connect with me on LinkedIn. Yeah. And, you, you know, I'm happy to actually connect and continue this conversation if people wanted to find out a, a lot more of what we're doing. And there were no questions today. And usually in a class, when there are no questions on academic, you think you've done a good job. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that was so. a good lecture or a very bad one. And everybody was asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was great. And there's um, been some nice comments from people here as well in the, in the, in the uh, chat as well. Um, so, yeah, so thanks. Thanks again. Well, thanks, uh, Leon. Thanks, everybody. And goodbye. <laughs>